how many know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh within us? Let's help me sing. Exceedingly, abundantly above all, all you can ask or think according to the power. Just what he said he will do. He's gonna fulfill every promise in you. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's able. Come on, put those hands together. Let's give God a praise on this morning. He's able. God.
Everybody sing, go.
everybody sing oh oh oh, 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 oh. I need I need you everybody sing oh
Well, I'm just so thankful to God to be able to be here today in service with you all. <coughs> it's been some time since I've been able to be here, had the privilege, and I'm just, I'm just so thankful just to be here with each one of you, to feel the presence of the Lord, and to be ministered unto, and hopefully to be a blessing. I just want to thank each one of you for the way that you have held Doyle and I up in prayer during this difficult time with Doyle's severe illness, with his lung condition, his heart condition. And uh, we definitely have felt the effects of those prayers. I've said we had truly been carried on the wings of prayers. And I, and I thank you. When someone is praying for you, I tell you, that means so very very much. Thank you for your love, the visits, the phone calls, just, you know, whatever, so many things. And uh, I've said so many times that Doyle and I have just felt from the bottom of our hearts with this ministry, each and every one of you individually are so special in your own way. You're special to God. And you know, God has created each one of us. We're just unique. We're just, we're different. <laughs> no two are exactly alike. And I just, I just thank God. I praise God just to be able to be a child of the king, a child of his. We are so privileged. And it's because of him. There's nothing good. There's nothing that we have to offer someone else that he doesn't give to us first. And he just wants, we, Jesus Christ was here walking on earth in time gone by. But today, he is just living through us, our mouth, our hands, our feet. And we just, you know, we, we just want to follow him, to honor him, and to serve him for his glory. That's why we were created. We were created to serve the Lord. That's the purpose. And I'm just so thankful that you young people here on this campus, you could be involved in so many activities, so many things to fill your time. But so many of you have taken the time. You come to Bible study on Wednesday night. You come here on Sunday mornings to worship God. And you serve God through the week, wherever that you're at. And that has been an inspiration to my husband and I. And we're just so honored and so blessed to be a part. Now, I want to share something with you all. I have my, I came across an article, a newspaper article. I hold on to a lot of things, but anyway, it's not Christmas yet, but we're getting close to it and uh, that time of the year. And this article, I just feel like that you would be blessed. I'll put my glasses on and I'll share it with you. Okay. But listen, oh, excuse me. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, the title this was this was in my newspaper back on Friday, December the fourteenth, two thousand one. Like I said, I hold on to a lot of things, right? The title of this is For Unto Us a Child is Born. Mary, did you know that the child you hold in your arms hung the stars in space? The one who cuddles warm and snug against your breast created our world. For the first time ever, God has been rocked to sleep. The omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God who knows all, sees all, and is the sovereign power of the universe is now dependent on you, Mary, to feed, clothe, and carry him. He who holds the world in the palm of his hand must be carried by you. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Isn't that what the angel said? For he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, yes, that is his name, the name that has given hope and life to so many. Why did he come? For what reason did God feel that it was necessary to become a man? 
I do not believe that it was because he wanted to understand or experience what it was like to be a man, because God already knew everything about a man. He even knows all our thoughts and motives. Nothing is hidden from him. I believe that he did it to show us the way to salvation. Just when we were about to think that our lives were hopeless and we were not far from giving up hope for ourselves. Close to the time that we had become convinced that God is so holy and sovereign that he is unapproachable and untouchable, he became a man. He became tired, hungry, thirsty, and even wept. He knew that we could not come to him in our current condition. Therefore, he came down to us in order to save us from our sins. God on a cross with nails in his hands. Just when we thought that we had him all figured out, he surprises us. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. St. John 1, 1, 3, and 14 is what we were referring to. Matthew provides confirmation of Christ's true identity. Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Isaiah granted the necessary information for us to recognize him hundreds of years prior to his birth. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 and 6. Paul declares that the evidence of his identity is irrefutable. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world received up into glory the babe that was born in a manger in bethlehem jesus christ was and is king of kings and lord of lords the savior for the world and this article was written by the reverend andrew robison So thankful that we know the true meaning of Christmas and that we have, we are so blessed to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you all. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you, Sister Connie. Watch this quote. Sister Connie has been a blessing. Oh, she was so strong, steadfast, and unmovable. Her faith was, and her perseverance really blessed me, and it's became, she was the one, and her husband was the one that stood in the gap for us, and thank God for her sharing those words. Let's give God a praise for her again. Amen. 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 And I have the privilege of introducing to you um, our, one of our speakers for today, to help break the bread of life on today. Um, beautiful sister in the Lord. Um, very, has a servant heart, meek in spirit, lowly in state. That's why God is able to use her. I don't want to delay the time. I'm going to introduce to you my sister, Sister Courtney Jones. Amen. Let's give a hand clap of praise as she comes. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you all, my brothers and sisters, but I just feel um, just an urgency for that this land needs healing, that 
people are hurting right now. If you look in the news today with everything that's going on with um, Ferguson and Eric Gardner, people are hurting, people are in pain, people's families are being affected, people um, are, are living in this world in fear. And so in the midst of all this, I was thinking, Jesus, what's the answer? And so he gave it to me, and I want to share with you all, if you turn to 2 Chronicles 7.14 and say amen when you get there, Jesus is the answer. In 2 Chronicles, it's in the Old Testament, chapter 7, verse 14. And it reads, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, sin and will heal their, heal their land. And I want to reiterate, he says, if we shall humble ourselves and pray, that prayer is what's the answer. We need to humble ourselves, pray and seek his face. We need to know who he is. We need to know what promises that Jesus has given us while we're here on this earth. We need to know what his word says. We need to know that he is our weapon, that he will heal this land. We all know it's so, it's so much going on in the world, even within America, that one, one person in our human form can't necessarily overcome all of the adversity, the marginalization, the oppression that's in this world. But Jesus, who created this earth, he can heal it. And us as Christians, he has put us on this earth to be able to make disciples of others to help spread his gospel so that we can know who he is. So that when we leave this earth, that we're in heaven with him. And that he, that he is the true God, that he has the truth, that we need... Jesus to be able to have that hope that we hold on to. Jesus was persecuted when he was on this earth. He suffered just for his faith. People in this world are persecuted. People in this world suffer for a variety of reasons, but we know that we can put our trust in Jesus because he overcame that despite all of the, he was, he was nailed to the cross for our sins. He made that sacrifice for us. He knew that this world had wickedness in it, that it had evilness in it, but he chose to sacrifice himself so that we can be forgiven of our sins, so that we may know who he is, so that we may have life more abundantly, so that when our flesh passes away, we are still a new creature, that we can find healing in him, that we can find healing for his land by seeking his face and praying. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 3.12. And as you do that, I want to tell you about a story about um, a story about um, a couple married for years, and marriage gets tough. Marriage is not easy. I know personally I'm married, um, but, you know, Prayer truly changes things. I know a couple whose marriage was in shambles, that it seemed irreconcilable, that they were on the verge of divorce, leaving one another from what God had put together for them. In prayer, people continued to pray for them. When they shared the news about their divorce, people were devastated. They knew that this wasn't the Lord's will for them to be separated. So people started to pray for their marriage, pray for them day in and day out, even the people that they didn't even know who was praying for them. And I tell you on today that the Lord has reconciled them, that the Lord answers prayers. So as you turn to your Bible on 1 Peter 3.12, it reads, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And I want you to understand that the Lord hears the prayers of the righteous. As it talked about in Second Chronicles, we need to know the Lord. We need to seek his face. He needs to know that you are his child. And when he knows that you are his child, he will hear you that you will pray to him and that his ears will be open and he will hear you because you are his child. You are the chosen one. You are the one that he called out of darkness 
into his light. He loves you. And if you will seek him and know who he is so that he knows that you are his child, he will answer your prayers. And if you don't believe me, turn to Psalm 18.6. The Lord talks about in Psalm 18, 6, as you're turning there, the Lord answers prayers, I promise you. I, I work in higher education, and I interact with a lot of students, but I know a personal story of a young lady who was a freshman in college, and she was um, experiencing some new things um, and was just um, living her life. And then, of course, we all go to the doctor. We get annual checkups. One day she went to the doctor and got a checkup, and found out that she might possibly have cancer. And it devastated her. She's a freshman in college, first semester away from her family, didn't know anything about what was going on. She went back again. The doctor told her again, yes, what I see it does seem cancerous. We don't know. We need to do further um, examinations to see if what you have is cancerous. She went home and prayed. She cried out to the Lord. She sought his face daily and went back, and it was clear. There was nothing. And the doctor told her that she had to keep going to just check to make sure nothing reoccurred. Still to this day, nothing has reoccurred. I tell you that my God answers prayers. <laughs> if you don't believe it, he answers prayers. In Psalm 18, verse 6, it reads, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. We all pray to the Lord, but I tell you the ones that Jesus knows that you are his child, that you are of his righteousness, that he will hear you, that he will hear it um, and, and answer you and answer your prayers. And lastly, I want you to turn to James 5. Verse 16, that the Lord says in James 5, verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one and, and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of the righteous man availeth much. My brothers and sisters, if you don't take anything away from this, you need to know the Lord. The Lord is our healer. He will heal what we're dealing with on the inside. He will d heal the stress and the pressure and the pain that we may feel on the outside. But we need to know him. We need to be called of his name. We need to be that righteous. We need to be holy. We need to let go of those things of this world and not be conformed to it, but be transformed. We need to seek the Lord's face. So that when we cry out to him, when we need him in the midnight hour, or when we're hurt, when we've lost our loved one, when we're feeling oppressed, when we're feeling marginalized, when we're feeling hurt, when we're feeling beat up, bullied, or abused, we know that God is hearing our prayers because we, that we know that he knows us, that we have that inside of us, that we can feel his Holy Spirit moving in us so that when we pray, that we know that he hears us. That college student, she knew that the Lord heard her, heard her prayers to heal her from that sickness that she didn't know what was going on. Those family members prayed for that couple. Despite their, op their, ob uh, despite their um, desire not to reconcile, they prayed for them, and the Lord heard and reconciled that marriage. I want to leave you with this. There was a young um, girl, she was in her early 20s, she was having a baby, her first child, and um, she kept going to the doctor, and the doctor saw that there was fluid in the child's belly, or in the child's belly, and he was afraid that it would, if it got to the child's brain, that the child would not um, develop properly. And so, months on end, you know, pregnancy lasts for about nine to 10 months, Months on end, there still was no change. The family couldn't figure out what was going on. The doctors didn't know what was going on. Um, the mother went to a, um, ch a specialized hospital and still couldn't figure out what was going on with the child and why, where this fluid came from, how much it was raising and things like that. So finally, um, the doctor said, we need to deliver the baby because we, we want to make sure that the it doesn't have any damage to the baby's brain. And so 
her, all of her family came and prayed over her that evening. And the next day, the doctors looked back and they were gonna do a C-section. And he said, it's gone. There's no fluid in the baby's belly. There's no fluid in the baby's body. For months, there had been some type of fluid in this child's body that they didn't know where it came from. But for one night of prayer, one night of prayer, where people sought out the Lord, there was healing, healing in that place. I pray that you get to know the Lord and that you will seek his face and that you will pray to him for your healing because the Lord healed me. I was that baby. The Lord healed me. Amen. Our pastor, Andrew Robinson, his heart truly breaks for the things that breaks his. He truly loves God and he truly loves his people. Let's give a hand clap of praise for the angel of our household. Pastor Dr. Andrew Robinson, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. <laughs> praise God. So glad to hear Sister Connie today. She hasn't been able to be with us for a while. Her husband, Boyle, passed recently, and she and he were, you know, foundational pillars within this ministry for many years and we just thank you sister connie for all your dedication and faithfulness in prayer and encouragement many of you have re received encouragement from sister connie and her husband we're certainly missing brother doyle it was a left a hole in all of our hearts to see him gone but i know he's in a much better land now such a man of truth and such a man of the word of god you talk to him, you, you want some insight in the word of God, you could have a conversation with Brother Doyle Conley, but we love you, Sister Connie. I know this is her last Sunday, except for coming and visiting, hopefully from time to time, but she's moving to Southern Illinois to be with her family there now, so we want to keep Sister Connie in our prayers. Be sure if you have a chance before she leaves today to let her know what a blessing that she has been to all of us and and she certainly has and but we love you and we appreciate you more than words could ever express sister connie thank you i w i was telling a story in my class the other day that i had read and it was about a professor and a student's assignment professor in Africa. Christina was there. She heard it. <laughs> so so you get to hear it again, Christina. Okay. But it kind of fit with what I want to share with you today. This African professor and student, the student submitted his paper to his professor and he got his paper turned back to him and the only feedback that he received on the paper was is this the best you can do? And so he goes and he rewrites things and fixes it better, and he submits it to his paper, his paper to the instructor again. And again, he gets the paper back. And on the paper it's written, the only feedback he received was, is this the best you can do? Second time. So he submits it, he redoes it, and he adds to it and makes it better, and he submits it a third time. And so he gets, he's waiting for his feedback, and the instructor or professor gives him his paper back, and the only feedback he received was, is this the best that you can do? So they go through this, Ten times. And on the tenth time when he writes, he, he finishes his paper, he knows that he has put his whole heart into it and given the best that he possibly could. He goes to the professor and he throws his paper down. And he said, this is the best I can do. And the professor says, good, I'll read this one.
One of the problems of our society today is the, this mediocrity that has overwhelmed our society where people try to see how little that they can get by with in their effort. There's no comprehension of the word sacrifice and commitment in a lot of places. But I want you to know today that God wants your best. He won't read the paper if you haven't given him your best. And look over to your neighbor, and that's the title of my sermon today, is Be Your Best. So look over to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, be your best. Be your best. It's time, it's time to be your best. The best you that you could possibly be. And so I came up with a brief acronym for being your best. First of all, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And so the B in being your best would be be brave. Be brave. What keeps us quite often from giving our best and doing our best in all that we attempt to do is fear of what? Failure, exactly. Fear of failure. We're a fear, fearful that we won't meet others' expectations, figure, fear that we won't be able to meet the standard. But if it is the best that you can give, then it has met the standard. But when you do your best, you create a demand for yourself. You create People will look at you. You'll draw, grab the attention of others when you're constantly putting your whole heart into it, giving your best. So be your best. And that, in, that requires overcoming fear. Doing it in spite of the intimidation that you might receive. Doing your best in spite of of all of those obstacles in your way and all of the things that people would say to try to discourage you, be brave. Look over to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, say, hey, be brave. You can do it. The E in best stands for be enthusiastic. Be enthusiastic. So if we're going to give our best, we've got to have some passion with giving our best, don't we? People who are not passionate about what they do are never going to be very good at it. We've got to have that enthusiasm, that passion in that feeling and that emotion and that desire within that drives us. And when we're serving God and trying to find God's will and His purpose for our life, then the, what motivates our faith and our commitment to God is one thing, and that is love. Paul said in the book of Galatians, he said, Faith which worketh by love. So the first commandment of all that Jesus gave us was what? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor as thyself. As thyself. Yes, okay. So it all is motivated by love. When you love somebody, and when you love something, there is enthusiasm involved. Is How many in here have a significant other? Do you love that person? Are you enthusiastic about that person? Are you passionate? 
about that person. So God wants, when we are walking in God's divine purpose for our life, trying to fulfill his life, his, his will for our lives, then we want to do it out of love for him, that same passion for him. There was a, it reminds me of a story of, of Jacob and Rachel. Jacob worked for seven years so he can marry Rachel. And then they had the wedding party and all of this, and he wakes up the next morning. His father-in-law tricked him, and he was married to Rachel's sister, Lee, or Leah. He, said, he comes to his father-in-law and said, what are you doing? He said, well, she's older than Rachel, and it's not right to let her, let Rachel be married before her older sister. So you had to take Leah. And so he, he said, well, you can have Rachel too if you work seven more years. So he worked for seven more years, 14 years. And the Bible says to him he loved her so much, his commitment and his drive for it and his dedication to her, his love was so deep for her that it didn't seem but just a short period of time. It seemed like but a day. Do we, do we really love God to that level? That God, I just want to please you. I just want to be with you. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be what you want me to be. And one thing I know that God wants you to be is he wants you to be the best that you can be. And with God, all things are possible, aren't they? The fear of failure that we have to battle. God tells us in Philippians 4 and 13 in his word, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So we want to be brave and we want to be enthusiastic. The S in best is that we want to, the next thing we got to do is set a standard. Set a standard. Not just trying to see how quickly I can get it done, but set a standard of excellence. Like in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 says, We have this power in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. So he's looking for excellency there. That we strive to give our best and not settle for mediocrity. If you're going to write a paper, you want to write it to the best that you can. If you're going to create a PowerPoint presentation, it's going to be the best that you could put it together. Most students I know wait till the night before the assignment's due. And it doesn't turn out very good. It looks like they started on it about midnight, usually. I just spend the whole weekend practicing, didn't them want to keep grading papers and things. And so. We want to give our best. If you, if you commit, if you give your time to something, give your best effort in that time. Ben Franklin said that time is the passing of life. Time is the passing of life. Life, the Bible refers to it as just a vapor. It's, it seems like just yesterday I was 19 years old. Where has the time gone? Wanda K, where's the time gone? Linda, where's the time gone? It's gone so fast. I know that seems like unreal. It seemed unreal to me when I was 19 as well. I thought people 30 years old were old. I remember that. I I meet some 30-year-olds, they act old. But the craziest thing, inside, 
I feel as young as I ever was. I have the same dreams, the same energy, the same enthusiasm, the same excitement for life, but yet I look in the mirror and I thought, oh my God, there's been an invasion of the body snatchers here. <laughs> Who is that beast I'm looking at in the, in the mirror? What happened to that handsome guy? <laughs> but what we give our time to, we're giving our life to. Those precious, the most valuable commodity that you and I have is our time. And whatever we give our time to, we're saying, I value you. I'm giving you a part of my life. We're here together sharing our time. We're actually sharing our lives together this morning. I can't think of anything better than being in the presence of God with my time. Because in His presence is fullness of joy. And also, He is the one that gives us eternal life, isn't He? I want to take a hold of that time that never ends, that eternal life, don't you? That comes for him. So set a standard. Look over to your neighbor and say, hey, set a standard. Raise the bar. Give your best. Do your best. Be your best. So we want to, in order to be our best, we want to be brave. We want to be enthusiastic. And we want to set a standard, a higher standard for ourselves. And the last one, but not the least one, is the T in best. We need to be tenacious. Tenacious. When we're tenacious, we don't quit easily. How many times that people start something and quit? How many of you this morning have, you could think of projects that you started and you quit before you finished it? I played sports in high school, and I lettered in actually four sports in high school. and I wouldn't ever quit a sport. One sport I ended up quitting, though. And my daughter, when she played sports, she wanted she didn't like to start playing t-ball, and she wanted to quit t-ball. She was bored standing out there in the field. I, and I, I was bored watching her. But, <laughs> but I wouldn't let her quit. I didn't want her to be a quitter. And I said, you, you can quit. You, you don't have to sign up for the next year. You don't have to do it again, but you've got to see the season through. You can't quit. Because you're not a quitter. But I did quit baseball in high school one year. It was my senior year in high school. Because they had games on my church night. And I thought I had to make a choice there. Whether to go play with the team or be in church. And I felt like I needed to, to be in church. I felt the call of God on my life. And I wanted to put God first. And so I chose to go to the house of God and gave up my baseball career, which I don't know that I had much of a career. It was, I wasn't as good as, at baseball as I was at sport, at uh, football, I mean. So, but anyway, we don't want, we want to be tenacious. We want to take a hold of, when we're being tenacious, we have the goal, the vision before us. We know where we're headed. And that's in order to be tenacious, we've got to know where we're going. If you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, right? So know where you're going. Where is it God is taking you? And the way to find, discover that is to draw closer to God. In our relationship with the Lord, as we draw closer to Him, then He begins to reveal to us our path in life. And he causes us to start desiring godly things in the direction that leads us right into the perfect job. When I started working here at the university, 
I was asked by the chair of the department back then, Mark Borgie, to teach here in the communication studies department. And I thought, well, I'll give it a try, I told him. I said, I'm a pastor first. I said, I'll, I'll see if I can do both. And so, okay. And so I've been here since teaching at the university, what, since 2005? 2005 now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But little did I know, I thought, well, I'm just going to teach some courses, you know, just get some experience here. And next thing I know, here I am, a campus ministry. So by just loving Jesus and putting him first in my life, he brought me here to this campus. And I can't think of, this is mine and Wanda Kay's favorite ministry we've ever done. Right here, working with you all. So be tenacious. Don't quit. Don't give up easy. Don't surrender easy. Don't let the naysayers discourage you when they say you can't do it. And one final story about being your best. There's a story in the Bible of a man named Joseph. How many remember Joseph in the Bible? Joseph was a dreamer. He was a visionary. He... he he saw in a dream and a vision God just raising him up to lead his people. And he, shared, he made a big mistake, though, because he shared it with his brothers. When they heard him telling about his dreams, and his father, his father loved him so much, Israel. Loved Joseph so much. And Joseph felt his father's love. And he loved his father. He was, he was so attached to his father. But his other brothers, they were jealous of Joseph. They didn't like his visions and his dreams. And what they did, they, were, they plotted to kill him. Isn't that the way it is sometimes? When you start raising your head up to rise above mediocrity and give your best, how many times you have people rallying around to tear you back down and to stop you and hinder you? That's what was happening to Joseph. When you draw closer to God, it's like everybody you meet, your old friends come, hey man, let's go party. You don't see them for a month, and then all of a sudden you get closer to God, they want to see you all the time. Where were you when I wasn't close to God? Those fly night friends. But when you start drawing closer to God, Come closer to your heavenly father, like Joseph to his father. You start having visions and dreams of making a difference in your world, making a positive impact on the world around you. You see something better, not only for yourself, but also for your, your friends, your family, your loved ones. The very thing that they were trying to destroy in Joseph was the very thing that rescued them in the end. Because a famine hit the land. They actually didn't kill Joseph. They sold him into slavery in Egypt. And while Joseph, did this discourage Joseph? Now he was his father's favorite. Felt the love of his father, and then he gets sold into slavery. His father thinks he's dead. They took a bloody cloth, a coat that he had. His father had made him a coat of many colors, and they put blood on it from a lamb so that they think that he'd been murdered or a wild beast had eaten him. And his father grieved over it. And here's Joseph. He's sold into slavery in Egypt, and he's serving in Potiphar's house. And while he's in Potiphar's house, you thought he'd sit down and have a pity party. And he'd just give up and quit. But what did Joseph do? He, he knew, I can't control my circumstances. I can't change where I am in this time in my life. I'm stuck here right now. So I'll just be the best person I can be in this situation. 
I'll keep doing my best and be my best regardless of all the circumstances around me. And as he was there, Potiphar put him in charge of all, his entire house. And when you get close to God and you're serving God and you're doing your best, it makes you more attractive too. You ladies looking for a good man? Be your best. Make yourself more attractive. You men the same. Be your best. Make you more attractive. And so then, his not, but Joseph, when he was doing his best, Potiphar's wife became attracted to him and tried to get him to have sex with her. And he refused to because he knew that was disobedience to God. He would not, he would not endanger his relationship with God as a result of that. And so he ran away and just got away from her. That's, that's one thing, lesson we could learn there. Whenever temptation comes, run away from it, right? It may save your life if you do. But she went and lied on him and said that he did attack her when she was the one that tried to attack him. And he's thrown in prison. So you think, well, finally... In prison, he'll become discouraged and he'll just quit and give up and get bitter in that situation. In those adverse circumstances, in order to be our best, there's a lot of people who become bitter instead of better. Joseph chose to become better. He could have easily become bitter and say, oh, poor me, and sit down and have a pity party. Poor me, nobody loves me, I think I'll eat some worms. I forget how the old saying goes. How's that go, Wonder King? Huh? What? Eat some worms and die. Okay. Yeah. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll eat some worms. Right. Okay. That's how it goes. I forgot. I hadn't heard that in a long time. It's amazing when you're getting older, the things that pop in your head. <laughs> Just out of nowhere, they come in there, you know. <laughs> but while he was in prison, he continued to do his best. He began, he still had visions and he still had dreams. And Pharaoh had a dream and nobody could interpret it. And the news of Joseph being someone who could interpret dreams, someone who was a visionary, came to Pharaoh. And so he sends for Joseph to come and interpret his dream, and he does precisely, and he tells him how to keep, he lets Pharaoh know that there's a famine of seven years of famine coming on Egypt, and he needs to store up for the seven years of plenty that's going to occur before then. But he said some of those years have already passed, so you've got to store, save a lot to be ready for the famine. And so from that interpretation, Pharaoh makes him second in command of his entire country. So Joseph goes from his father's preferred favorite to sold in slavery to the prison house, and now he's second only to the king. And his brothers come to the land, and it'll make a long story short. He, during the years of famine, he forgives his brothers and he saves their lives from starvation because he was a person of excellence, a man who chose not to settle for mediocrity. Your, by giving your best, being your best and finding God's walking in God's divine purpose for your life, you may not only save yourself, you may be saving your family, your friends, and other people around you as a result of it. So be tenacious and don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your vision. How many has got a vision in this house this morning to be the best that you can be? God, help us to be better. Help us to be our best. Whatever your hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Turn with me one final scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10.
Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Time is short, so let's give our best. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with thy might. If we look in the original Hebrew of that passage, we'll find it says, do it with all your might, everything within you. Would you stand with me? Praise God. Praise God. I believe this morning that God wants, that God is challenging you to draw closer to him.